we should be recording now. So it's a joy for me to introduce the four speaker this term, Professor Subia Suchtev. He's going to give a talk on um, simple models for entangled qubits, how it um, describes superconducting, superconductors in black holes. Professor Suchtev is a visible researcher in the field of condensed matter and Herschel Smith Professor of Physics at Harvard University. Our esteemed speaker has quite a few different fellowships and awards and prizes, but among these are the Dirac Medal of the ICTP and the last Onzaga Prize of the American Physical Society. Yeah, thank you for coming and taking the time for us. I have three logistical questions to everyone in the audience. First of all, please mute your audio unless you're specifically speaking. Secondly, I'd appreciate it if at least some people would turn the video on. It makes the whole experience a tiny bit more human. If I can see other people than just me confused when the talk starts getting hard. And third of all, please ask questions, loads of questions. I think, um, Professor Fletcher, if you were happy, you're going to stop every now and then ask the questions, and you're happy if people who are confused interrupt once in a while. So just ask questions. That's a personal question myself. Other than that, welcome everyone, and the floor is all yours. Thank you for coming. Okay, well, uh, so can you see my screen now? And and now you should be seeing my first slide. Misha, is that correct? Yeah, exactly. And we can see the All right. Well, thank you very much, uh, Misha. It's a real pleasure and honor to be speaking to this historical society. Uh, certainly, I would have liked it better to be there in person and maybe someday even take part in the cricket game, uh, although I haven't played cricket since my high school days in India. Uh, Okay, so the talk uh, by Misha's guidance uh, is at the sort of uh, mid undergraduate level. I assume everyone's taken at least a course in quantum physics. Uh, of course, at a few points toward the end, I might get a little uh, more sophisticated. Uh, but in any case, please do not hesitate to answer, ask questions, uh, either by interrupting me, well, hopefully not too often, uh, or, or I'm putting a message in the chat. All right, so uh, as the title says, I'm going to talk about a, a model of entangled qubits, uh, which uh, I proposed with my student, Jin uh, you know, several decades ago, but recently has acquired uh, quite more interest in the study of black holes, although our original motivation was and continues to be in the study of the high temperature superconductors. So I'll try to connect with both those topics uh, in my presentation. All right, so the, oops, uh, yeah, the central actor uh, in my talk is quantum entanglement. So here's just a, a New York Times article from about five years ago uh, showing that what Einstein calls spooky action at a distance uh, is definitely real. Uh, not that any physicists really doubted it in the recent past uh, because of its fundamental role in so many phenomena in quantum physics, but here uh, is an experiment that explicitly tested uh, the basic quote-unquote paradox that uh, Einstein had pointed out uh, when he was, uh, I mean, I mean, along with Podolsky and Rosen, he was noting what was really in some ways the most interesting feature of quantum mechanics. Uh, and just to summarize, this is what it is. So if you, you think, you imagine you have uh, an electron in a hydrogen atom and we're just simply going to identify it by its spin, which can be either up or down. Uh, whereas in a molecule, uh, the spins are correlated or entangled more precisely, where if the spin of one electron is up, then the spin of the other electron uh, is down. And they're in this entangled state, uh, spin singlet state, uh, where the spin of neither electron is determined, uh, but they're always anti-correlated. So this kind of quantum entanglement uh, leads to uh, leads to a quote-unquote paradox, which EPR pointed out, uh, which is that imagine you could separate the two uh, electrons without disturbing the spin. Uh, then the correlation would still persist because the quantum entanglement, quantum state hasn't changed in the spin sector anyway. Uh, so if you measure one electron to be up, uh, then instantaneously, apparently, the second electron collapses its state uh, to the down state or vice versa. So there seems to be 
uh, a violation of what philosopher would call some local realism that the state of this electron here is not fully determined or specified uh, locally. You need to know the wave function of the other electron far away uh, to fully specify what's going on here. Okay, but of course, this is not a paradox. This is a fact uh, and doesn't lead to any logical inconsistencies. Uh, and what I want to talk about today is implications of this entanglement feature, not just for a pair of particles, but uh, really an infinite number of particles. Okay, so I'm going to do that first by just introducing uh, a simple model of interacting qubits, uh, which will then have many interesting properties. Okay, so just to summarize, then a qubit is a, the very simplest quantum state, like the spin of an electron, but it could be any other two-state system. Uh, so we call them up and down. Uh, and then, then in a quantum computer, there's various gates that can act on this uh, qubit. Uh, so we used to call these sigma x, sigma y, and sigma z, but now we call them capital X, Y, and Z because of the in influence of quantum information. Uh, and so the X gate flips the spin, the Y gate also flips the spin in addition to a, a phase factor and a Z gate doesn't flip the spin, but gives you a minus sign uh, on the down spin. All right, so now of course people are very cleverly building devices where you can apply these gates at will on individual qubits. Uh, uh, so that's not the point of view I'm gonna take, although you could take such a point of view. Uh, I'm going to think in terms of a more physicist traditional point of view where I imagine I have a set of qubits with some interactions between them. And a typical interaction uh, that will play a central role in my discussion is so-called Heisenberg interaction. Uh, here, x1 refers to, I have now two qubits, and x1 refers to an x gate acting on the first qubit and x2 on the second qubit. So the two x1 and x2 or x1 and z2 all commute with each other. Uh, but on any given site, there's the x, y, z qubit and then the x2, y2 and z2 qubit, and this is the Hamiltonian. So now you can try to determine the spectrum of this operator made up of these uh, two qubit, uh, qubit operators on two sites. So they're a total of four states. Uh, and when you uh, diagnose the Hamiltonian, as is well known, uh, you get the ground state of this entangled state of the two qubits that I just mentioned for a hydrogen molecule. Uh, and that's the lower energy state. And then the other states happen to be degenerate uh, and uh, they have varying uh, accounts of entanglement. So I'm going to begin my talk, since this is a math seminar, by just posing a math problem, uh, which is not solved, uh, which is we want to solve, this is the model in its simplicity. It's just the two qubit uh, Hamiltonian just introduced. And I apply it in pairs to a large number N uh, of qubits. So I have N qubits on N sites, labeled by one through N, I equals one through N. And between any pair of qubits, I have an interaction which I call uh, a coupling between them, J I J. So the model that will be the simple model in my title is basically this model uh, with one more feature. I have to specify the J I J. And we here we make a very simple assumption uh, that these are just random numbers with zero mean. Uh, so they have so, and, and in fact, you can take almost any distribution of these uh, random numbers as long as they're independent from each other. Uh, and it turns out to be useful to scale their variance uh, with one over n. Uh, okay. So, so that's the model. Now, this model is still extremely difficult. We still have no firm understanding of what uh, its spectrum looks like. Um, there's some numerical work, so we have a pretty good idea. Uh, but there's a cousin of this model, which for technical reasons, I'm not writing out explicitly. Uh, now you can think of this, uh, um, uh, these X, Y, and Z gates um, as operating on a two-state uh, qubit. And so then you have a, the two-state qubits realizes a representation of the SU2 rotation group. Uh, and in fact, the Hamiltonian also has a global SU2 symmetry. 
Um, so if you generalize this model to where you, you expand SU2 to SUM, and then take this limit, n goes to infinity followed by m goes to infinity, uh, that's the precise problem uh, that, in fact, we solved some aspects of in 93. And since as we've learned much more about her work by many people over the, over the years. Uh, all of this work is uh, highly non-rigorous, involves certain assumptions, which have then been verified by numerical studies. Uh, but, okay, so but here's a well-posed math problem on this uh, site, on, on this slide. And uh, it would be great if <laughs> more mathematically inclined physicists uh, can say more, make more rigorous statements on this uh, on this problem. So as we'll see, there's a lot of very strong claims on on its properties, which have uh, very interesting physical implications. So here's a, kind of a picture of it. You've got n qubits, and I'm representing the state of the qubit by an arrow. Uh, and then there's the interactions between pairs of qubits, which uh, you can imagine just exchanges the orientation of the spins. So, and each of these interactions can act between any pair of qubits uh, and is a random number. Okay. All right. So, so that's the that's the entire problem. Uh, hopefully, any questions on the statement of the model? That's going to be the central actor in my discussion from now on. All right. So everyone understands what the model is. Okay, uh, so, and I, and I won't say this again, but it's only for ease of presentation that I've written it in the simple form. The statements I'm making rigorously, well, not rigorously, are, are believed to apply to this particular generalization. And there's other variations of it, uh, which are somewhat easier, don't require a double limit that, that was introduced by Ketev uh, more recently, but they have essentially the same properties. Uh, I'm using this older uh, version because, in fact, on the application to superconductors, it's this version that's relevant. Okay, so the main result, uh, which wasn't in my 93 papers, but which uh, I kind of outlined without any detailed proof and some conjectures in 2010, uh, but was then proven in the physicist uh, style. Uh, by Kitev and Maldasena and Stanford. Uh, and this result is the following, which is uh, really quite surprising. So if you take, evaluate the partition function at a temperature T of the Hamiltonian, that is the determinant spectrum, uh, and then just evaluate the trace over all states, uh, that can be written in the following manner. Uh, there's an overall prefactor, which is, gives you an entropy S0, uh, and this entropy will soon be identified as the analog uh, of the Bekenstein Hawking entropy of a charged black hole at very low temperatures. Um, and this was first computed in this work with George and Parcolet, uh, this number. Uh, and then there are corrections to the partition function, which give you in this, if you're computing the partition function, they just give you the temperature dependence of the entropy. Uh, at low temperatures. Uh, but of course, there are other quantities you can compute, which also are controlled by, by the same partition function. And what is this partition function? Well, this partition function is in fact, as stated here, uh, the path integral of a theory of gravity in two space-time dimensions. Uh, so, okay. Uh, and I'll say a little bit about what precisely that theory of gravity is. Uh, and the degree of freedom here, f of tau, uh, has two interpretations depending on which model you're thinking about. If you're thinking about the qubit model, uh, f of tau is simply the reparameterization of time. It's, so it turns out you can write the partition function as a path integral over imaginary time, as, as you know, as can be done even for a single particle. Uh, and if you look at that path integral, you'll find that at low energies, because of certain uh, uh, scale invariant structure of the low energy spectrum, uh, that is invariant under reparameterization of time. So this is somewhat analogous to uh, critical points like the 3D Ising model uh, at its critical point is invariant under conformal transformations of space. Uh, and this is somewhat analogous, it's a somewhat larger Symmetry, it's not just conformal transformation, it's arbitrary 
uh, reparameterizations. Uh, anyway, that's the degree of freedom here. The action itself is not fully has corrections due to breaking of reparameterization invariance to the conformal symmetry of, of uh, one plus of, of zero plus one dimensions. But in the gravity language, you could think of f of tau uh, as a boundary graviton. So there's a theory of 2D gravity, which lives in 1 plus 1 space-time dimensions. Uh, and it's the fluctuations of that. So now in, in two-dimensional gravity uh, is almost uh, purely gauge. You can just gauge away many things. So there is no graviton. Uh, but if you take the system in a finite uh, box with a boundary, uh, then you'll find that there is a dynamical excitation, uh, which is uh, the boundary graviton. So that's so gravity is extremely simple in uh, in one plus one dimension. Uh, there's only a boundary graviton. But what's interesting about it, uh, there are still black holes, and the black holes behave very much like black holes in higher dimensions. Uh, and a lot of the puzzling questions uh, on uh, quantum information and black holes can also be posed for in, in, in such theories. Uh, right, so I guess I've also mentioned this, the action of 2D gravity is const uh, constrained by an emergent time reparameterization symmetry, which is sort of like the scale invariance in time, uh, which is broken down to conformal symmetry uh, which in this case is SL2R. These are, which I will write down explicitly in, in a few minutes. Uh, that's a mapping of the circle in imaginary time to itself. All right, um, so that's the claim. Now, I, it would take me too far afield and perhaps too much technicality to actually establish it. Uh, I would uh, refer you to this, actually, this paper by Marla Sena in Stanford that really goes through and uh, the argument in, in some detail. Uh, but uh, I will, this being a math seminar, I will present a derivation uh, from the gravities from the black hole side of the same, of the same action uh, a bit later. Uh, but okay, but if there's still questions on what the main result is, this would be a good point to ask them. Uh, mm -hmm. And Yes. I just got a question privately in the chat, which uh, somebody thought one plus one dimensional gravity was, in quotes, trivial. Where does it yes. they come from in your setup? So. Uh, well, no, if you just take the Einstein equations in one plus one dimensions and look for a graviton, you will find that there is no graviton. That's, that's, that's uh, all I was saying. If you take general theory of general relativity, uh, but if you impose, if you take a, a space with a boundary, uh, and you'll see why that arises in uh, in explicit physical realization soon. Uh, then you do get uh, a quantum theory of fluctuations of uh, the metric, uh, and that quantum theory that you get you would get from 2D gravity with the boundary quantized uh, is exactly the theory that appears here. Uh, starting from the qubit model. So there's two different ways to get this partition function. One is you can start from the qubit model and know absolutely nothing about uh, Einstein's theory and just turn the crank. And if you're smart enough at the very end of the day by just doing just the usual tricks that, phys that physicists love to do with path integrals, uh, you know, integrating outfields, integrating infields, decoupling terms, taking the low energy limit, you just turn the crank, and in the end, you will get this theory. Alternatively, you could start from Einstein's equations uh, in a certain black hole configuration and, and do a semi-classical quantization to a, of the fluctuations about a certain black hole solution, uh, and you would get exactly this. And I'm going to describe that second calculation in a bit more detail in a few minutes. All right, thank the you. First one, I'm not, the first calculation I'm not describing uh, well, I I would just refer you to the Maldasen and Stanford paper. It would just be, uh, suffice to say, you know, after the fact, it looks rather straightforward, but uh, <laughs> there was, you know, you needed to, to know which direction to go. Okay. okay. Cheers. Yeah. Okay. okay. If there's any other questions, please be, feel free to ask. Yeah. All right. Uh, so, so what is, so this is, so let's accept this statement for now, uh, but being 
Okay, next matter physicist, you could say, uh, well, okay, that's great. Uh, maybe the gravity people are interested in it. Why should I be interested as a condensed matter physicist? Uh, and so, so just to show you in the condensed matter language what some of the implications of this are. Uh, and this is some recent work with my students, Maria Tikhanovskaya and Hayo Go and postdoc uh, Grisha Tanapolsky. So what uh, they computed was what I call the local susceptibility. This is something that might be measured in a neutron scattering experiment. So what it is this quantity here at zero temperature anyway. Uh, so here the ket n refers to the set of all possible eigenstates of the qubit Hamiltonian. Uh, and this is zero is the ground state. So you're going to sum over all states with weighted by the matrix element between say the X operator on a given site uh, between the ground state and all uh, excited states. Uh, and you take the matrix element squared, uh, and then you demand that the energy difference between the two states, n and zero, be the frequency omega. So the frequency dependence of this gives us what's called the imaginary part, really, the dynamic of the dynamic spin susceptibility. So it turns out that this quantity uh, we can now compute in some detail. Uh, the leading term uh, is this h bar omega over 2 kBt. Uh, and this was actually obtained by George and Parkolet some time back. Uh, and this is uh, one representation of this conformal symmetry or SL2R symmetry that I'm uh, referring to. Uh, there are similar spectra in many conformal field theories in higher dimensions. Uh, and so this, the remarkable feature about this spectrum from an experimental point of view uh, is that the only frequency scale that appears that determines the nature of the spectrum uh, is temperature itself, or uh, the, the time scale, the characteristic time scale is Planck's constant divided by the temperature measured in units of energy. In particular, there was another energy scale in the, in the spectrum, which determines the spectrum really, uh, which is the, just the coupling, you know, uh, this J. So J is an energy scale, which is very important. It's the variance of the JIJ. Uh, and that, doesn't appear in the frequency dependence of the spectrum at non-zero temperature. It may appear, it does appear as a pre-factor to normalize things, but not in the scale of the frequency. And that's one of the strong indications uh, of the scale invariant structure, that everything is dominated by this, uh, what I'm going to call the Planckian time, because it's only determined by Planck's constant and the temperature. Uh, Okay, so that was known, and that's just the invariant part. Now it turns out, what about the gravitational fluctuations? Well, they give you the second term. So the boundary graviton turns out to be uh, a frequency dependent correction, uh, which can be completely computed. And this in fact appears from computing this graviton propagator. That's how you determine this result. Uh, and the coefficient here, uh, gamma is in fact related to the specific heat of the model and C is a pure number that you can compute from that path integral I just outlined. Uh, and so this leads to this, if you look plot the spectrum as a function of frequency over temperature, this fall off at higher frequencies is due to this correction. Anyway, so that gives you the flavor of the, you know, what you get in, in condensed matter physics from this model. So there the model I defined it and I showed you that it's, uh, in fact, secretly hiding a theory of it's very simple theory of quantum theory of gravity, and, and that and the gravitational fluctuation, the quantum gravity part of it, can be all evaluated very carefully, and they do have significant implications uh, for things you can measure uh, from these qubits. All right, so now I am going to go to part three of my talk, uh, which is I'm going to talk about black holes for a while. Uh, I am a little bit, you know, on thin ice here because I'm by no means an expert on black holes, but in recent years, <laughs> I've learned a lot from talking to experts, I think, uh, and I'll try to convey my understanding of black hole physics to you in the next few minutes. All right, so, so what is a black hole? Well, it's a solution of Einstein's theory of general relativity uh, which, where you have a region of space-time uh, that uh, the, the matter is so dense uh, 
uh, that light itself cannot escape from that region. So here's a inside of a black hole and any light emitted in this region will not be able to ever go out classically. Uh, and the, the, the outside of it is called the horizon and this is the radius of it. So if M is the mass of the black hole and this is the radius uh, given by this very simple formula. Uh, I guess originally obtained by, uh, was it Desider? Yeah, I think so. Okay. All right, so that's a classical black hole as uh, measured in uh, Einstein's theory. Uh, but now black holes have quantum effects as uh, Hawking so famously uh, discovered. Uh, and one way to understand his result is to imagine, go back to this uh, canonical picture of quantum entanglement of separating two qubits and imagine separating them on two sides uh, of the horizon. So one of the qubits is inside and the other one is outside. And quantum mechanics would say that it's still true that the two qubits are entangled. So there is something about the outside of a black hole uh, that is determines, that is de that is relies on knowing something about inside of the black hole. So there is something, uh, so not information, but uh, at least some quantum correlation that can uh, straddle a black hole horizon. Okay, so there's quantum entanglement between the inside uh, and outside of a black hole. Now using this quantum entanglement, although the Hawking showed that both black holes have an entropy and a temperature, I don't believe he ever used the word entanglement, uh, but that's how we would say it today. Um, so, and roughly speaking, the way you can understand this uh, is that if you're sitting outside of the black hole with this qubit in your hand, uh, you can never know what state of the other qubit is because uh, there's no uh, signal that can classically be sent from this person inside the black hole to you out here. So as far as you're concerned, the state of this qubit is indeed just random. You can just trace out the state of the black hole and then you have uh, a random qubit then has to be at a certain temperature. And how can you compute that temperature uh, uh, of the black hole? Uh, and also argued, that was the earlier argument by Beckenstein that there is also uh, an entropy associated uh, with the fact that you have no information of the state of the qubit inside the black hole. Okay, so that's now the so quantum black holes. These are the basic properties. They have an entropy and a temperature. Uh, also, since the entropy is associated with entanglement at the surface of the black hole, you get a very surprising result that the entropy is proportional to the surface area of a black hole. Uh, and, and this uh, dimensional reduction of the entropy is in fact crucial for also the SYK model where you had a model in zero plus one dimension leading to a black hole in two dimensions. So it was a, a model in one lower dimension that models, uh, that describes the entropy. Um, all right, so, so here I'm just showing you for interest, a uh, beautiful detection by LIGO uh, of the merger of two, two black holes. Uh, but in particular, I want to focus on what they actually measured. Uh, so they measure the merger of the black holes, which uh, happens through some very complicated gravitational dynamics, but there's a very last phase of it, the so-called ring down uh, of the black hole before it becomes a perfect sphere. Uh, and if I accept uh, uh, Hawking's procedure, that uh, proposal that a black hole is simply a body in thermal equilibrium, uh, that ring down time is basically the thermal equilibration time. So very last bit of where assist parties coming into thermal equilibrium uh, after, you, uh, after you perturbed it. So you can compute this ring down time from Einstein's GR. There's no H bar in it. Uh, and this is the time you get. And for this particular black hole, it's eight milliseconds, uh, which is really not resolved. So they haven't actually seen the ring down of the black hole this very large stage, at least for this in this data. I don't know what the situation is since then. Uh, but here, I just want to point out that this thermal equilibration time, uh, if I choose to express it in terms of the Hawking temperature, uh, then it's in fact precisely 
H bar divided by the Hawking temperature of the black hole. So, uh, so this particular feature uh, was really what first uh, prompted me to propose a connection between the SYK model and black holes. And because as I showed you earlier, the spectrum of the SYK model and also its thermal equilibration time, I haven't shown you that data, uh, is just determined by the Planckian time. Where all you need to know is the temperature and it's totally independent of high energy scales like the coupling constants in the problem. And that also seems to be the case for black holes. They seem to have this universal Planckian time equilibration, thermal equilibration, uh, not just in Einstein theory of gravity, but more, more generally. Uh, the quasi-normal modes are, have this very universal ring down time. So that gives you at least, uh, and you know, what stimulated me in the first, first place to, to, to propose that the SYK model might be connected to black holes. Okay. Uh, all right, so I guess I've said everything here. Uh, all right, so now let me uh, establish, or at least outline the other claim uh, that I made, and I'll try to make a very precise claim, this being a math talk. So let's start with Einstein's and Maxwell's theory of relativity uh, and look for solutions. Now in practice, it, you know, we are, no, most black holes do not have net charge, uh, but it's possible to have a net charge where the Coulomb repulsion that tends to explode uh, the charges apart is balanced by the gravitational attraction. So as long as you don't have too much charge, uh, then a black hole solution uh, is stable. All right, so, so this is called the Reisner Nordstrom solution of the Einstein Maxwell theory. Um, and if you zoom in to the horizon uh, of this black hole, uh, something remarkable happens. And this is, again, just a property of uh, uh, a charged black hole. Uh, you find that near the horizon, the, now we have a, a theory uh, in, you know, in three space, and I'll use the coordinates X and zeta to represent the three spatial coordinates, and activity in three plus one space. find that all the action in the x-direction uh, decouples. So if you're just looking Uh, the 2D gravity theory that uh, until the SYK model came in the scene by uh, first done by uh, uh, Kitev and Maldus in Stanford. All right, so let me outline not precisely what they did, but what they did in this context, uh, my extrapolation of what they did. So we start, so here's another perfectly uh, visible math problem that I can state for this math seminar. Uh, so here's the action of Einstein-Maxwell theory, you know, written generally in D plus two dimensions, but D is two in the pictures anyway. Uh, so this is Newton's constant, the kappa squared. Uh, this is the uh, Ricci's curvature scalar. Um, this is a cosmological constant. Uh, which I take to be live, although in fact the result doesn't really require it you know, in the end. And this is the Maxwell theory. So you just here's the action. You just look at this uh, the the Euler-Lagrange equations of this action, uh, and you solve them. You solve them for the metric uh, and the electromagnetic field. Uh, and the, this particular solution was obtained by Shamblin et al. in 1999. So you get a solution which is written here. This comes from just solving the Euler-Lagrange equations of this action. Uh, this is the equation for the metric. Uh, and the metric, you know, okay, it's not, and this is the equation for the, for the uh, vector potential. And this should be. Okay, so 
So, so I has some electric field going out to infinity zero, and that electric field by Gauss's law has a total charge Q. So Q is a parameter of the total charge in the black hole. And the other parameter is the mass of the black hole, uh, which determines the radius of the horizon R0. Okay. Uh, and then uh, this describes the following metric. And uh, yeah, I'll show a picture. Negative, that's the this location of the horizon uh, of the black hole. Uh, and then there's even out at infinity because of the negative cosmological constant, uh, the metric has some negative curvature. Uh, it's turned out to be anti decider space, but you can make that curvature as small as you want uh, and it won't influence what's happening near the black hole horizon. So if you take the solution and, and you do some relatively elementary uh, machinations to it near the horizon, so R, you, let's replace it by R sub H. So everything is expressed in terms of R sub H. And you measure your coordinates in terms of deviations from the horizon. So R minus R sub H is some number here divided by zeta. So zeta is my coordinate now, which goes to infinity at the horizon. So it's this coordinate here. Uh, Whoops. So that's the zeta. And you just substitute it in it, and then you see the main claim. So this part only involves near the horizon, pi and zeta. This is the center to here. This is the metric of anti -disc. 